Okay. I'll give everybody about another minute or two. Like it's going to be a light crowd this morning. <clears throat> we'll go ahead and get started. It's it's time. Let's bow and word of prayer. Jeremy, Father, just be with us this morning as we open your Scripture, your Word. And we dive into this Jerusalem Council. Just open our hearts, open our minds, and just help us to listen. Help the Holy Spirit to lead us. Help the Holy Spirit to lead me in what I say. Just guide us and protect us in Christ's name. Amen. So today we're going to be looking at Acts chapter 15. Uh, we're going to be looking at the Jerusalem Council. So up till, up till now, we've had the apostles basically work out of Jerusalem. They've been, they've been going to the Jews first and the Samaritans, which, are, which still follow Jewish custom. And then they went to God-fearers. They went to Gentiles, but they were going to God-fearing Gentiles. That means these were Gentiles that were sympathetic to Judaism. They still tried to follow Ju- the Judish, Jewish customs. So suddenly, the church is exploding in Antioch. And... If you want to think about it, the church starts going out from Antioch. So you've got, the, you've got the corporate headquarters of Christianity led by the apostles in Jerusalem. And you've got the distribution center of this Christian corporation in Antioch. So Antioch, it's just spreading out into the Gentiles. All of a sudden, these Judaizers that are in the church, they're like, you know, before you know, we were letting Gentiles in, but those were Gentiles that, that, that liked us. Now, suddenly, there's an influx of Gentiles that have, that have no idea what Judaism is. They don't even follow any of Moses' customs or laws. And there's a, they've got a problem with that. So, these Judaizers, let's start reading in verses 1 and 2 in chapters 15. But some men came down from Judea and were teaching the brothers, unless you are circumcised according to the custom of Moses, you cannot be saved. And after Paul and Barnabas had no small dissension and debate with them, Paul and Barnabas and some of the others were appointed to go up to Jerusalem to the apostles and the elders about this question. So let's look at verse 1. There's two important things to look at in verse 1. First, we see that these these Judaizers, these people that want Christians to still have to follow the Jewish customs, Moses' customs, laws, are traveling to Antioch. And as they're traveling to Antioch, they're telling everybody, hey, you can't be saved unless you are circumcised or follow Moses' laws. They get to Antioch and start preaching this. All right, one thing they say, notice that Luke is very uh, specific. He doesn't say, if you look at, uh, they must be circumcised according to the custom of Moses. He, he specifically uses the word custom. He doesn't use the law of Moses. I think it would be a very different argument if they were arguing for the law of Moses because we still follow the law of Moses or the laws. Some of the laws. We don't follow all of them. But the customs, they're, they're going up and they're bringing these Jewish customs and trying to put these customs onto the new believers, the new Gentiles. Okay? I think it's important. Does anybody have a, a different word than customs in a different translation? Okay. I was just curious. And then, the second thing they do is they make one statement that has to be addressed. They say, you cannot. If you want to circle something in your Bible, I would circle cannot. You cannot be saved 
unless you follow these customs. That's where they cross the line. We're going to see later that in the, at the, at, towards the end of chapter of this Jerusalem Council that following the customs of Moses is not necessarily sinful. But where this becomes sinful and this, where this becomes something of debate is when they add this to salvation, that they cannot be saved. Their salvation is meaningless unless they are following the customs of Moses. So they're basically adding to salvation. You cannot be saved. So this was an issue that went to the core of Christianity, and it had to be resolved. And as soon as Paul and Barnabas hear it, they confront it as a false doctrine. They immediately, and it says, I, I, the wording is, is fun, it's just like a, with no small dissension and debate. So Paul confronts this. Paul and Barnabas confront this outright. They're like, no, you cannot say this. And it becomes such a huge confrontation that the church in Antioch says, listen, we, it, and you would think if Paul and Barnabas are coming, we, we know who Paul is. But you would think if Paul came to you and said, no, this is wrong, what you were hearing is wrong, you would just say, okay, it's wrong. Paul just said it's wrong. But these people in Antioch said, okay, we're not sure. We're not sure if the Judaizers are right. We're not sure if Paul or Barnabas is right. So we need direction. So they assigned Paul and Barnabas and others, it wasn't just Paul and Barnabas, others to go to Jerusalem and meet with the apostles and the church in Jerusalem, which is we said already is kind of the corporate headquarters that's where Christianity's main focus is right now to, to get this question answered. So, let's read further. Let's read through chapter, uh, verse 5. So, being sent on their way by the church, this is Paul and Barnabas and the others, they passed through both Phoenicia and Samaria, describing in detail the conversation of the Gentiles and brought great joy to all the brothers. When they came to Jerusalem, they were welcomed by the church and the apostles and the elders, and they declared all that God had done with them. But some believers who belonged to the party of the Pharisees rose up and said, it is necessary to circumcise them and to order them to keep the law of Moses. All right, now we have this law of Moses. Okay. So, as Paul and Barnabas go to Jerusalem, we see that they are preaching like, this is just another opportunity to preach. It's not, this was not a road trip. This was not like, okay, we need to go to Jerusalem. Let's get on our donkeys and go. It's like, okay, we need to go to Jerusalem, but on our way, we're going to preach the entire way there. And they were sharing this truth. They took every opportunity. Everywhere they went, they were, get, they were spreading the gospel. So we've been talking about, you know, prescriptive and descriptive. This is a very descriptive chapter. This is a very descriptive chapter of what, something that happened in the early church. But there's a lot of descriptive, there's a lot of prescriptive truths that we could pull out of this, such as everywhere we go is an opportunity to spread the gospel. And, I, and, I, and, and I've said this numerous times, the purpose of Acts is to spread the gospel. So we see in everything that Paul does, we see everything that Peter does, everywhere they go, it's, it's an, he, they are looking for opportunities to spread the gospel. So once they get to Jerusalem, they, are, they report immediately. They don't get there and say, hey, we've got this problem. We need to talk about this. They get there and they start discussing, telling the Jerusalem leaders, like, this is what's happening. This is what's happening in Antioch. This is, you know, we're leading Gentiles to Christ. And they were excited. They were like, this is wonderful. The kingdom is growing. The, the gospel is being presented. But then... There's this group in verse 5. These are converted Pharisees. Um, so there were some, even though we think of Pharisees and Sadducees as the ones that condemned Jesus to the cross or killed Stephen, we know that there were some Pharisees that were converted to Christ. We know two of them by name. Anybody can think of those two? This is, a, this is just a fun quiz. We got probably Nicod uh, Nicodemus and... Saul. <laughs> Saul was a Pharisee. So these Pharisees speak up, and who's there to t talk against them? But the one man who is most qualified to answer these Pharisaical questions. He was a Pharisee. Okay? So they basically acknowledge 
that Jesus is the Messiah. They, they believe that Jesus is the Messiah. He has come. But they still cannot let go of their J- Jewish customs. They think you still need to be justified before God by keeping the law. Okay? They still haven't grasped the full comprehension that Jesus came and fulfilled the law. Okay? So they taught two things. They, they taught that first, Gentiles must convert and be initiated in Judaism through circumcision. And second, that the Gentile converts must live under the law of Moses if they were to be right with God and embrace it in the Christian community. So, and they had, if you think about it, let me take the side of the Pharisees for a second. Because I think in modern day churches, we get caught up in customs. We get caught up in, you know, this is the way things have always been done in the church and we don't want to move. They had scripture to back them up. They could go back to Exodus 12, 48 and 49. They could go back to Isaiah 56, 6. These were all verses that described how Gentiles could come into the kingdom to the chosen people of Israel. So there were specific laws, there were specific verses in the Old Testament that tell these Pharisees, hey, if a Gentile comes into your camp, if they want to serve with you in, in, a, in a, anything with the Jewish custom, if they want to go to the temple or if they wanted to serve with a, a Pentecost or anything, this is what they need to do. This is what a Gentile needs to do to be a part of the Jewish nation. Okay, So the Pharisees, they're not, they're not just pulling this out of nowhere. They have scriptural backing. They're looking at the Old Testament and saying, we've been told this. Why aren't we doing it? Why are we just letting all these Gentiles that have no concern for Moses' law at all come into, the king, come into this faith, this, this Christian faith? So then we look at verses 6 through 12. We're going to see the council start. So the apostles and the elders gather together, okay? And they bring in this council. And this is, you would think, this is like a, a, a very... If you're bringing... We, we know today what the apostles are, so if, you bring a, if we're bringing this before the apostles... You would think this is this is all that needs to be, but we don't. We, this wasn't just brought before the apostles. This was before, brought before a council of apostles and elders. So this is like um, R.C. Sproul says. This is very notable that a decision of such significance was not settled upon by one apostle, even though it could have been via divine revelation. Instead, the church as a whole considered this. Okay. So this was not just brought, hey, the apostles that walked with Jesus are in Jerusalem. We need to take this to them and get, there, get what they say. No, this was, we need to go to the leaders of our church. And as part of that, the apostles were there. So this is the only council that we have in history where we have the apostles as part of the council. We have this great group of men that actually served with Jesus. Okay? So let's look at verses 15, 6 through 12. And the apostles, the, the apostles and the elders, that it is necessary to circumcise them in order to, and and order them to of Moses. So they're considering that matter. And after there had been much debate, so there's been a lot of talking. Peter stands up and he says, "Brothers, you know that in the early days God made a choice among you that by my mouth the Gentiles should hear the word of the gospel and believe." So remember, Peter was already primed for this argument because he had seen the vision of, of the sheet that came down with all the animals and, and, to, and they, to allow the Gentiles in. So Peter, to be the first one to stand up and speak, he was already, God had already prepared him for this argument, okay? And God, verse 8, who knows the heart, bore witness to them by giving them the Holy Spirit just as he did to us, and he made no distinction between them and us having cleansed their hearts by faith. Now, therefore, why are you putting God to the test by placing a yoke on the neck of the disciples that neither our fathers nor we have been able to bear? But we believe that we will be saved through the grace of the Lord Jesus just as they will. Okay, I'm going to stop at verse 11. So here's Peter's argument. He's like, listen, God has given the Holy Spirit to the Gentiles, the exact same as to us. He's like, 
He doesn't say so that they can be like us. He's not saying God is bringing the Gentiles in so they can be like us in our kingdom. He's like, we will be saved. We as a people will be saved just as they will. He brings them in. He puts them in the same. He doesn't make them separate. He doesn't separate Jew from Gentile. He takes the Gentile and makes the same argument that they're receiving the exact same gifts from the Holy Spirit as anyone who comes to Christ. There's no distinction. If you come to Christ, you see these things happen. And they are seeing the same things happen in the Gentile community as they are in the Jewish community. So Peter is coming from this argument like, listen, what, what's the difference? What's the difference between a Jew and a Gentile? God is working in the Gentiles the exact same way He's working with us. So you're putting these laws on these people and let me remind you something about these laws. We've been, had to been, we've been held to these laws for thousands of years. And guess what? We can't keep them. We've never been able to keep God's laws. We've never been able to keep Moses' laws. We, are, we always mess up. So why are we putting these same restrictions on these new Christians? Basically, what he's saying is Christ has paid, has completed all these laws, and you're still wanting to put this yoke of laws on these new converts and these Gentiles, something that we as Jews haven't been able to keep in our thousand, thousands of years of having the law. Okay? And I think it's a great argument. I mean, he's, he's, going, he's doing a good job of just painting out, listen, this is what, this is what we've, we've had in the past. Jesus has fulfilled it. This is not specifically said in Scripture, but we know Jesus has fulfilled the law. And we were never able to keep the law. So why are we pushing something on somebody that we know we can't keep and expect them to keep it. If we can't keep it, then they can't keep it either. So then, we see that we see how Peter's heart is is purified by faith. He's not not he's our Christianity, our 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 faith is by faith only. It's not by keeping the law. They were purified by faith. Then, if they if and if they are purified by faith, which is what Scripture says then there was no need to be purified by submitting to ceremonies found in the law of Moses. So we're not, Christians are not only saved by faith, but we're also cleansed by faith. And that's important, the that's important thing to remember. The laws of Moses were for cleansing, for forgiveness of sin. We were going for the temple and asking for forgiveness. You were purified through the law but you could not keep the law. So therefore, you had, to commit, you had to give sacrifice in the temple. Jesus fulfilled that purification. Jesus' sacrifice met all the requirements for the law. So now we are purified not through anything we, we can do. We are purified by, by trusting and believing that Jesus' sacrifice was the ultimate sacrifice. So we no longer are under that law. We have been purified we, Jesus' death has purified us in a way that the Old Testament laws could not purify the Jewish. They, they had to continually be purified. We are now purified once. And that's through the death of Christ. So then we're going to look at verse, let's see, I think it's verse 11. I stopped at verse 10. Well, let me, let me, let me, let me go back. We see that the Jewish Christians... We're not saved by their law keeping. We've said that. And then we're going to see in, in the beginning of verse 12. Let's start reading verse 12. Let's read verses 12 through 21. And all the assembly fell silent. And they listened to Barnabas and Paul as they related what signs and wonders God had done through them among the Gentiles. After they finished speaking, James replied, Brothers, listen to me. Simeon, who is Simeon, who is Paul? I'm sorry. Simeon, who is Peter? I got the wrong word Simeon is Peter Peter has related how God first visited the Gentiles to take away take from them a people for his name and with this the words of the prophets agree just as is written so he quote he's going to quote Amos he I think he's quoting Amos 9 11 through 12 after this I will return and I will rebuild the tent of David that has fallen I will rebuild its ruins and, re and I will restore it that the remnant of mankind may seek the Lord and all the Gentiles who are called by my name, says the Lord, who make these things known from old. Therefore, my judgment 
is that we should not trouble those of the Gentiles who turn to God, but should write them to them to abstain from the things polluted by idols and from sexual immorality and from what has been strangled and from blood. For from ancient generations, Moses has had in every city those who proclaim him, for he has read every Sabbath in the synagogues. Okay. So let's look at verse 12. Go quiet. All right. So Peter has some authority. And then as soon as it's quiet, Paul and Barnabas step up. And they don't really make, it doesn't say they really made an argument either way. They start telling the council of everything that has been happening in the Gentiles, in Antioch with the Gentiles. The proof that God is with the Gentiles, that they are coming to Christ. They're building their case not through you're right, I'm wrong, or I'm right, you're wrong. They built the case and like, this is what's going on. Let me just tell you what's going on in the Gentile world in Antioch. And then after they do this, James, who interests, interestingly, James is the head of this council. We, we think of Peter as being the head of the church. And I think Thad may have said this last week. James was the head of the church in Jerusalem. James, the brother of Jesus, was the head of the church. He was over these elders and was over the head. So he was, James was actually the chairman of this council. If we want to call him a chairman, I don't think they used that term back then, but we would call him the chairman of the council, not Peter. So when James hears Peter's arguments and he hears what Paul and Barnabas have to say, he stands up with the authority that he has as being the chairman of the council. And he quotes Scripture. Okay, He doesn't give his opinion. And uh, I think this is where one thing that is, is prescriptive for us in the future when we have councils. Councils are not set up. We have councils today where we have issues that come up with the church within our denomination. We bring in councils and we discuss them and we come to a conclusion. Those councils are not set up for us to debate who's right and who's wrong. Those councils should be set up. I'm not saying that doesn't happen. We are, we are a sinful men. We are sinful people. And sometimes councils can go in the wrong direction. But the, the purpose of a council is this. You take this, you dive into it, and you're like, here's the question that's before the church. What does Scripture say? How can we take Scripture and answer this question? It's not men's opinions that end councils. It's what does Scripture say and how does Scripture address this question and how do we move forward from Scripture? And that's exactly what James did. James did not say, oh, I, I, hear, I hear what you guys are saying and, and you make a lot of sense. He's saying, no, let's go to Scripture. Let's go to Amos. And in Amos, it talks about the Gentiles in the Old Testament coming to God. Okay. And we see that James, after he quotes it, we see that he well, we see that James remembers that the Judaism, Judaism okay, of his day, that modern day Judaism, had fallen down. It had fallen down in the sense that it had been re, it, basically Jews had rejected the Messiah. Okay. Now and that's what Amos is talking about. Amos is talking about rebuilding that tabernacle. He's rebuilding his people. So God wanted to rebuild the work that he started in the Jewish nation. And, and, and we've got to separate, I think we need to be careful, we need to separate the nation of Israel and the people of Israel, or the people of God. Sometimes we, we kind of get those, those, we've, those are kind of blurred. We talk, we talk about the nation of Israel as God's chosen people, which they were, but inside the nation of Israel was the people of Israel, the people of God that actually had faith in God. So these people of faith, these, this nation, the nation of Israel rejected the Messiah, Messiah, the people of God. And I think we see that in the Pharisees that came to Christ. There were people of God, people of Israel that accepted Jesus as the Messiah. Okay. So he's going back. Um, James is saying through Amos, God wanted to rebuild the work that he started with the Jewish nation. And he focuses the church. He's focusing on a church that's made up of both Jews and Gentiles. So now the, the work of God, the, 
the God fears won't be limited to a geographical area of Jew, of the nation of Israel. It will be it can spread all over the world. Okay, there's there does not have to be one temple that people have to go to. That temple has been fulfilled through the death of Christ. So now this salvation, this gospel, this good news can go to all the world and you can serve God in your church or wherever you are in the world without having to worry about going to Jerusalem to the temple. Okay? So, we look at verse 19. We said, we've got therefore. So, he says, therefore, my judgment. So, James, we don't see that they took a vote. We don't see that. James says, he's almost acting as a judge in this. He's hearing everyone's disputes. He's hearing everyone's arguments. And then James says, this is my judgment. Okay? He shows that he had a position of high authority in the church. And then he pronounced the final sentence. Okay? And then this final sentence, he, he says that Gentile believers, he makes this statement, Gentile believers should not be under the Mosaic law as was also given, and it was given with practical instruction, okay? So he made a, the, so what we get out of this council is we have a proclamation that salvation is by faith that the Gentiles do not need to be circumcised or follow the customs of Moses to be saved. Salvation is through faith alone. And that is an important thing that came out because what we have is we had this view that it wasn't just faith. It was faith plus something else. The Jerusalem Council says, no, we reject that. That's re- we reject it. Salvation is through faith alone. You cannot add anything to salvation. But, and this is where the letter comes from, and I think this has a lot of relevance in today's society. He's saying, this is, this is false doctrine. You cannot add to salvation. The Gentiles are, are saved through their faith alone. But, let's write a letter to them because there's Jewish communities in all these cities. And, he, and we see that the whole world is familiar with Scripture or could be familiar with Scripture because Scripture is read in all the synagogues out loud. So if there was a synagogue in your city, there's a chance you might have heard Scripture being read out loud. So a lot of the Gentiles may have had some of this knowledge in their head. But James wants to make sure they know they don't have to follow these Jewish customs, but they still need to Abstain from things polluted by idols, what has been strangled, and from blood. So basically, unclean animals. Animals that still had blood in their system or animals that had been sacrificed to idols. We already know in Peter's vision that these were no longer unclean. But in Jewish custom, these were very unclean. And the Jewish people were still keeping this law. They were still keeping the food laws And there was nothing wrong with that. It was not a sin to continue following those dietary laws. We we don't see that anywhere in Scripture. We do see in Scripture that the sin was saying that you had to keep those dietary laws to be a Christian. But we see in this council, it's like, no, you do not. You're a Christian because of faith. But if you decide to keep these monetary laws, that's fine. Just don't require it of people around you and don't require it as part of your salvation. So, they basically what James is telling these Gentiles is, listen, you are not bound by these laws. You're not bound by these dietary laws. You're not bound by any of this. But you're bound under the law of love. Okay? They're still your brothers and sisters in Christ. They are still people who have faith in Jesus. So, out of respect for them, we don't want to unnecessarily antagonize our Jewish neighbors both in and out of the church. Okay? So James, the, 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 basically the church is saying, listen, we disagree that this has to be done. 
for your salvation. But if you have Jewish neighbors that are following these laws, that's fine. Let them do it. They can't, they can't make you follow them and you can't tell them to stop. You can't tell them you're free. Don't flaunt your freedom in front of them that you don't have to follow those laws. And they shouldn't flaunt the flaws that you have to do them. The Christian church is open to different... I don't want to say ideas. That's a wrong term. But the Christian church can hold the Gentiles and their customs that are not sinful customs and the customs of the Jews, Okay as long as the Jews don't say that those customs lead to salvation. Okay? Now, they still they don't have the temple anymore, so there is no sacrifice, but you could still have a Christian Jewish person that still tried to follow a lot of the Mosaic laws, and there's nothing wrong with that, as long as they're not adding those to their salvation. Okay? And we see that, and that's kind of a preference. Like, we see that in churches today. Where there's, there's different preferences we have in churches. And sometimes we can get really upset over preferences. And I'll, I'll give you an example. When we moved to this church, there was a preference to have pews and not the chairs. There was, like, some people were, like, really not upset, but, like, they were really disturbed that we were putting chairs in the sanctuary and not pews, okay? Is it sinful to sit in the chair and not a pew? No. But it's a preference. And it's, it can be a legitimate preference because you might want to come to church and, and be more um, official, I guess is the word I'm looking for. Like Instead of just being more casual in a chair, a pew makes it feel a little bit more. And that's a preference. There's nothing wrong with either one. Absolutely nothing wrong. Now, if it becomes to something that divides the church, then it needs something to address. But it's okay to, to express, like, go to Robert's. Like, listen, I would really rather, I, I prefer pews over chairs. And then Robert should lovingly say, okay, I understand. I think that's great. But this is a temporary sanctuary, and for now we're going to use chairs. And when we build an actual sanctuary, we will have pews. That's, that's The whole point of this is we need to be loving in our differences. So if we have differences, it's okay to voice them. It's okay to come to your leaders and say, I have, I have a preference that I don't I don't like, I don't, I'm not comfortable with this. I'd rather have this. But the church should never say, your preference is stupid. What do you think? There should always be love in everything. We should always have a discussion and be able to talk about our preferences. All right. There's nothing wrong with having preferences. There's nothing wrong with one church feeling like they should have music this way and a church, another church have it music this way. It's a preference of the church. But what we do is we, we make it a law. We make it like the law of Moses, like, you can't have a church with this or you can't have a church with that. So we've got to be very careful and be loving to our other brothers and sisters in Christ. It may have a separate, as long as they're still teaching Scripture, okay? We're not talking about false teaching or stuff. And they might have a preference about they do something different from us. We have to show, we need to show them love and they need to show us love. There should not be any condemnation going in either direction. Like, we do it one way, you do it another way, you're wrong and we're right. There should always be this sense of, we respect you as our brothers and sisters in Christ, and you're doing something differently with us, but unless you can pull up Scripture, unless you can say in Scripture, if you have a church that's like refuses to do uh, communion, like, we're not doing communion anymore, we don't think it needs to be done. Then you can say, okay, I... I disagree with that. That's, no, that's more than just a preference. That's going against Scripture. But if there's, if, I, I don't mean to keep going back to music, but if they have a different music style and, you're, and you have a different music style, you know, you can go to a church that fits your preference and they can go to a church that fits their preference. And I don't think either, either one is right or wrong. It's just the way, it's just a preference. Okay, and I think that's what, James is getting to because he gets he gets into this like these Christian Jews are choosing to still follow Moses' law and customs. And we need to respect them and love them. It's not wrong for them to do it and it's not wrong for you not to do it. Okay? But let, <laughs> yeah, I don't want to I don't want to bring masks up, but yeah. Masks there are it's a preference and that's exactly. I mean, we should love our brothers that want to wear masks and we should love our brothers that don't want to wear masks 
the the overall issue is not the important thing. We're just we are a body of believers. We're brothers and sisters in Christ. It's a preference. So, um, but then he does say they need to abstain from sexual immorality. So he goes from this the, this dietary thing and he moves into this sexual immorality. Okay. Both Jew and Gentile knew that sex outside of marriage was wrong. Okay, that was not the issue here. But there's a lot of laws or customs in the Jewish faith that prevent people from marrying in, you know, inside your you know, own family or other things. That the Gentiles didn't necessarily follow those laws. They, they might marry their cousin or something like that. So part of this letter says, okay, don't, don't eat these polluted foods, these meats, and abstain from sexual immoral. Let, let's, let's, let's not, let's kind of respect the Jewish custom of marriage. So the, he does kind of say, don't do something to offend the Jews, even if it's in marriage. So this might have been a little bit more difficult because you might have been, might have maybe arranged with a, a first cousin or something that the Jews would not uh, particularly be a, um, a pl- agreeable with. So um, I think this is interesting, but it basically, it's just something that the, the letter is basically saying, you're Christians by faith and faith alone, but please be considerate of your Jewish brothers and sisters. Let's not offend them. Let's do, let's, let's not condemn them for what they do, and they're not going to condemn you for what you do not do. Okay. And we're still, we're talking about things that are outside of Scripture. We're not talking about scriptural laws like the Ten Commandments. We're talking about customs, okay? So to be loving towards these two, you basically got two different, let's just call them denominations of Christianity right out of the bat. You got the Jewish Christian church and the Gentile Christian church, okay? And they need to, be able to love each other of, for the, because they're going they're two separate they're two separate have two separate customs they're two separate people okay so yes now go ahead I'm, I'm, I'm ready to move forward so Uh, if you like it, in Jewish tradition, they would kill the animal and drain the blood. So they were not allowed to eat any meat with blood in it. So that's, you know, you know, even when you kill a deer, you, you, you slit its throat and let the, and you let it bleed out. Um, and then you process the meat after it bleeds out. Um, what they're talking about here, like if you strangle an animal and kill it, and then you immediately start eating it, you have not drained the blood. The, the blood stays in the body. So you're basically like uh, a boiling, uh, a lie. we do that today in a sense we take a lobster we throw it in a boiling pot and then we eat the lobster we have not drained the blood out of the lobster of course that lobster was an unclean animal in the old testament we still eat it but we don't think about eating the blood of the lobster because it's all boiled it's all cooked in there and then we eat the we eat the lobster that's kind of a really bad example but you know you they were not allowed to eat anything with blood in it at, at all so there, there had to be a process of getting draining the blood totally out of the meat before they could actually eat it. So, any more comments or questions? Yes? Mm-hmm. Exactly. Exactly, and, and we and we kind of forget that because we're we're in this New Testament age, but there there really was a, a huge picture in the sacrifice and the draining of blood out of animals and the way that they ate meat. It was everything they did was a picture of how God related to them as a people. Mm-hmm. Exactly. Mm-hmm. That's right. Yes, 
the, there was the re- re- redemption in that shedding of blood that they saw every time that they killed an animal or sacrificed an animal. They saw that blood that was had to be sacrificed for their either redemption or their sustenance. Okay, and then we see Jesus come and He fulfills all that. He fulfills all our needs in His shedding of His blood. Very excellent point. Thank you. We drink the blood mm-hmm. as a as a symbol of what He did for us. So I know it is kind of funny because we you know you go from this you cannot have blood to now we representatively drink the blood because of what Jesus has done. We've totally flipped that. You know, if you, if you told a, an ancient Jewish person before Christ, we're going to drink this blood. This is blood. We're going to drink it. They'd be, they would be horrified. And now, because of what Jesus has done, we can use that as a symbol. And we can use that as a remembrance. So, it's, 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 and, and, and that's why I said earlier, like, I'm going to take the side of the Pharisees, because I think, I know who I am. I'm a sinner. And I know that I'm a stubborn man. I think if I had been a Pharisee, I think I would have been one of the ones that sat there and condemned Christ to the cross. I don't think I would have had a soft heart toward Christianity. I think I would have been set in my ways and we've done it this way for thousands of years. We have the law of Moses and who are you to come in and tell me that this is no longer valid and that this person from Galilee has come and he's the Messiah? Seriously? You know, I think I, I think I would have had a hard time. I don't know. The Holy Spirit would have touched me and changed me. But I can understand the frustration of the Pharisees. I can, I can see how it was hard for them to step out of the Old Testament into the age of grace. It makes sense to me because they, ha- they do. They've got Scripture. Like they quoted Scripture. They can go back to Scripture and say, hey, Scripture says this. And the disciples and the council have to come back and say, I know Scripture says this, but you also have to look at other Scripture in Amos where it says this is what's going to happen after the Messiah comes. So you've got to look at the whole picture and know that God had a plan. Even though we were under this law, there was a plan that when the Messiah came that this, would be, this law would be put away and there would be a new way to Him through, through the Messiah, through Christ. You know, that this Christ would be raised up and that the Gentiles would be brought in. So I, I ha- I'm sympathetic toward the Pharisees in a, in a sense. I think, I think they had a... Yeah, exactly. It would have been, it would have been difficult to... Because they, they, I mean, that was radical. I mean, you talk about radical. When Jesus came and, and died and rose again and then, the, and then this, this salvation starts going out to the Gentiles, how radical that was for these... Pharisees who, I mean, they're Pharisees. They're not just Jewish god fears They're Pharisees who have kept the law, who read it out loud daily. These are men who care about Scripture. And their, their world's being turned upside down. And, but we see in that that there are Pharisees that came to Christ. We see in that they, they became these Judaizers, which I think is understandable, but they still understood that Christ was the Messiah, and they, but they still had to reckon with what that meant. And they were still having to struggle with that. So, mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. they did. They were under the law, and they, it, it's, it's even hard today when you, when you talk to Christians that are, are under a lot of rules and regulations, it's hard to preach about the freedom in Christ sometimes that you don't there's you don't have to follow law you don't have to follow you know you don't have to go to church every Sunday if you miss a Sunday you're going to go to hell you know it's 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 hard because when you're under that when you're under that law when you've been told if you do this then this happens it's hard to accept the freedom that we have in Christ and we do we've got this we've got this freedom that is almost unexplainable through Christ so there's no law or there's nothing we can do to make God love us more. There's things we can do. We need to be in God's Word. I mean, we don't, I don't, I'm not saying we don't need to just be reprobates, but there's nothing that we can do in our actions to make a, our salvation more clear or more exact. 
We are saved through our faith, and there's nothing we can do to save us except through that. Okay, let's go on ahead and... How are we doing on time? Let's go ahead and move into verse... Uh, I think we're in 22. So then they, they put together this letter. We're going to read 22 through... Let's read through 29. Then it seemed good to the apostles and the elders with the whole church to choose men from among them and send them to Antioch with Paul and Barnabas. And they sent Judas, called Barsabbas, and Silas, leading men among the brothers, with the following letter. And here's the letter. The brothers, both the apostles and the elders, to the brothers who are of the Gentiles in Antioch in Syria and Cilicia. Greetings. Since we have heard that some persons have gone out from us and troubled you with words, unsettling your minds, although we gave them no instruction. So basically, these guys that are going out and telling you that you have to be circumcised to be saved, we, we didn't tell them to do that. They did it on their own. Okay? It has seemed good to us, having come to one accord, to choose men and send them to you with our beloved Barnabas and Paul, men who have risked their lives for the sake of our Lord Jesus Christ. We have therefore sent Judas and Silas who themselves will tell you the same things by word of mouth. For it has seemed good to the Holy Spirit and to us to lay on you no greater burden than this requirement, that you abstain from what has been sacrificed to idols and from blood and from what has been strangled and from sexual immorality. If you keep yourselves from these, you will do well. And then it says farewell. Okay? So after, Paul make, after James makes this proclamation and says this is what we're going to do, everyone's pleased. And, it, and it, we don't have any record that there was any dissension at all. It sounds like this entire council, I think the Holy Spirit was present. I, I know the Holy Spirit was present. And even these Pharisees that stood up and said this, in this council, it seems like they were in one accord. Now we do see later that these Judaizers do continue to hinder the church. Okay, There's still going to be this constant attack on the Christian faith through these Judaizers. But what we have recorded in Scripture for here is that everyone at that council was in one accord. Okay, They all came together and they all were agreement. And when this letter was sent out, it was very pleasing. And they choose, of course, Paul and Barnabas and some other men to go with them to be uh, examples to, to tell by their own mouth. And one of these people is Silas. We'll see Silas, Paul and Silas, of course, in the future. And they carry this letter to Antioch. And let's finish up with the last five verses here. 30 through 35. So, when they were sent off, these men, Paul and Barnabas, Silas and these men, were sent off. They went down to Antioch. So they went. They were up in Jerusalem on the mountain. They went down the mountain. Even though they were going north, they were going down. And having gathered the congregation together, they delivered the letter. And when they had read it, they rejoiced because of its encouragement. And Judas and Silas, who were themselves prophets, encouraged and strengthened the brothers with many words. And after they had spent some time, they were sent off in peace by the brothers to whom, to those who had sent them. But Paul and Barnabas remained in Antioch, teaching and preaching the word of the Lord with many and others also. So what we see is Paul and Barnabas and these men get to Antioch. And these people, you know, I, I guess I can understand. They're, they're like, man, I've, I've become a Christian and this is, this is the most wonderful thing that's ever happened to me. I mean, I've experienced the Holy Spirit. I've been baptized. I want to live for Christ. But now, am I going to have to be circumcised? Am I going to have to start following all these rules? Like, I'm confused. I'm really, you know, this is hard. And then they're waiting. You know, this probably took months. They're waiting for this word to come back. And all of a sudden, Paul and Barnabas come back and says, listen, all right, let's, let's all gather. I'm going to read you a letter. And when they hear that letter, they're like, I mean, the, the, like Peter said, that yoke, that potential yoke that was on them fell off. And I can imagine the joy and the peace that they experienced. Like, oh, it is just by faith. I am a Christian. I am a follower of Christ. And I'm going to heaven someday because I have faith in Him. 
I don't have to do anything else to do this. And I think I can understand why there was rejoicing because they just they were just they were they were given a, a letter from their church leaders that says you're free, basically. You are not under the law anymore. You are free. Now go spread this gospel. Okay. And so we see that that they stayed there and they encouraged, and Judas and Silas stayed there, and then the church just continued to grow and grow in Antioch and spread out. And like I said earlier, Antioch truly became a distribution center to the entire world. This, this reprobate city that we learned, out, learned of earlier is, be, is going to become Paul's home church. And we see how this, this home church gets together and sends Paul, sends Barnabas out, send, he'll, they'll send Silas out, they'll send Timothy and Titus out. All these men of God are, are going to be based, their base is going to be out of Antioch, not out of Jerusalem. We see Jerusalem becoming less and less as the center of the Christian world. And we see Antioch and these other cities in Corinth and Ephesus and all this become mighty centers for Christianity. Okay. So what do we get out of all this? I think we've kind of we've kind of touched on it. We know that when false teaching comes into the church, it needs to be addressed immediately. As soon as Paul and Barnabas heard that there was something that you had to do to be saved, they heard that you had to be circumcised, you had to follow the laws of Moses, or you were not saved, they immediately addressed it. Okay? And when this, it still could not be solved, then it went higher up. It went to their, their church, this council, and this was solved. So anytime in today's society, we still have councils. We still have issues that come up in our church, in our denomination, and our presbytery will get together and have a council and discuss things. But these councils, like I said, the councils should be decided on through Scripture, not opinion. There should never be a man's opinion that solves a council. A council, if a council cannot go to Scripture and get a clear answer, then I don't think it's a it's a godly council. We've we've had ungodly councils. I'm not. I know we come from this. We think, okay, something's wrong. We have a council, and God will take care of it. We've had some pretty bad councils. Yes, ma'am. The presbytery, or the. It would. I'll I'll let Stephen probably. Well, so what we take from this is that uh, a joint decision, mm -hmm. right? Because it's not one man who makes well, it's kind of like the Pope. You, you don't see one man saying this is the way we're going to go. You see a group of uh, elders and apostles making decisions. So that does happen at our presbytery level. And also at the general assembly level. Who is in the presbytery? Like we would be on the council now for both Right. For our denomination. Well, all of the churches in our region form the presbytery. So that's ten is a nine. And then after that, if they can't agree, then it goes to the general assembly. And yeah. and what's interesting here, and you all can tell me. This is all the yeah. Okay, so Teaching elders back. and some ruling elders. Like okay. churches can appoint, I think, two, three ruling elders based on their size. But what's um, interesting is they basically appeal to the council that says Jerusalem is through this larger body. And we have that right here. If you think something's going on here that you just isn't fair or, or right or biblical, you can appeal to Presbyterian. You, as a member of this church, can appeal to Presbyterian and say, I don't think this is right. You have that authority in this church. And then the Presbytery will say they have that. Of course, you go to the set people, and then if they, they say, no, we, we still don't like it, then you go to Presbytery. And you have that right. And then if you don't like that answer, you can go to the General Assembly. Now, once the gen General Assembly speaks, then it's a matter of consensus and approval. But, but as members, we have that right to appeal to the larger body. Does that make sense? Yeah. Well, I'll just repeat that for the people on the internet. What we have as a, as a church, as a PCA church, you have the right to appeal to your session. And if you 
want to appeal higher, you can go to your presbytery. And that presbytery is made up of other pastors, teaching elders, and some ruling elders. And then if it goes beyond that, it goes to the General Assembly. And the General Assembly is made up of all the presbyteries, of, te- of basically teaching elders and a few ruling elders. And once they make a decision, it's pretty much set in stone. That's, that's the, the head of the stream for our decisions, for our denomination. Now, I don't know how long it's been since we've had like a council of it's cross denominational borders. Do you know? Other, no, th- we, we don't. We, the, the closest thing to like the state. Yeah. Or yes, there are. And there have been statements that have made, like denominations have made statements that other denominations have said, hey, we agree with that statement. They weren't part of the decision making process, but a denomination or even a church. Uh, 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 an individual church has made a statement and they've brought they've, they've sent it out to the world and they've said this is what we believe and other churches have said hey we agree with you 100% we back you up we've got your back on this okay that's kind of the closest we get today to uh, an overarching council yes sir oh absolutely and that is, and that, and I think that's what we need to take out of this. When there, those statements do come out, we do need to be critical of how we read those. If they are not scripturally based statements, then we don't need to back them up. And uh, so, if a, if a church comes out with a statement and it's based on scripture, then yes, we need to back it up. But if it's just if you're you're exactly right, there have been multiple churches that have made statements that have been false doctrine or false or, or, or something false not and are not based on scripture or have taken scripture and twisted it and we wouldn't back it up. We wouldn't we wouldn't confirm that statement. So it is something that we have to be careful with. So and that's what I'm saying. We're we're even with councils today and with statements, we're not perfect. We've got to be we've got to go into all these councils and statements with scripture and make sure that these councils and statements follow Scripture. And then as a church, if we, if we want to tag along on some of these statements, we can. We have that right. We might offend some people in our own church, and, we don't, and, that's, and that's the other thing that this teaches. That's the other thing that we need to take away. We need to be careful in our statements, whether in a council or a written statement, that we're not offending our Christian brothers. Now, if there's something that we need to say that to rebuke, then I think that's different. That's a different. A, re, a, a rebuke and offend an offense is different. If we see another PCA church doing something against Scripture, and the Presbytery gets together and writes a letter to that church and rebukes them because they're not following Scripture, that's different. But when we, if we're making a general statement on a belief, or on uh, there's been statements written about the LGBT issues, about um, abortion issues, and stuff like that, have been statements have been made and other Christians said, I agree with what you're saying. I, I, I back you up in that. But there, you've got to be very careful not to offend. And that's what this council did is they made this statement, but they, the, the ultimate purpose of the statement was to clarify a problem, which they did with, under no uncertain terms. They, they said, this is wrong, but let's love each other. Let's not offend our Jewish brothers, let's not offend our Gentile brothers. We are a community of Christ. We are settling this question once and for all. But as we go forward, let's respect some of the customs that's going on right now. And that's where we as a church can still today, there are still internal customs, even in this church, in Hicks and Prez, that some people have a custom of one way and some people have a custom of another. But it doesn't, it should not break our fellowship. So we need to be careful about what's a custom, what's a rule, what's going against Scripture, and when we need to rebuke and when we need to be uh, generous and loving. Okay? We've got about, we're almost out of time. Any more questions? Yes, sir. Mm hmm.
I, you are, I think you're I you are one hundred percent correct. And I think we forget that. That when we do become members, we do raise our hand and say that we, we put ourselves under the rules of this church. Because being on the session and seeing some of the things that people bring to the session, they do get upset if we don't do what they want to do. Okay? And if and, and about preferences, I'm not talking about scripture, I'm talking about preferences. And some, you know, you, we can have people leave the church because we've made a decision, they didn't agree with the decision. Okay? But you are absolutely right. If, they, if you think back and you do, even if it's a preference of yours, but if you put yourself under that leadership, once that session has spoken, it's easier said than done. I know that. But you should have that respect. You, 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 you should take it serious. That's, that's, what I, that's what I say to people when... Uh, they're becoming members, you should take that membership serious. Same as when you are ordained as, an, as a leader. It's not a, it's not a little thing. When you raise your hand and say you'll put yourself under that authority, you've got to remember, I'm putting myself under this authority. I'm making, I'm agreeing before these men to put myself under their authority. And then when you don't like it and you leave, then you just say, well, I, I didn't really mean it when I raised my hand. Okay? Now, there are, there are some legitimate, people have legitimate concerns that they bring before the session, and, and we need to hear that we need to be loving. But on the whole, I think, I think you nailed it on the head. I think when, when you raise that, your right hand, that you are going to put yourself under that authority. I think people, I don't think people take that as serious as they need to. And I think even in the Christian walk, I think we, it's, it's very easy to make Christianity fit the way we want it to, to make it. And, that's, and I think that's the weak, weakness of the American church is our freedom to make Christianity look like what we want it to look like, and we can't do that. Um, that's one of the things I like about the Presbyterian Church, is we, do, we are very rigid. We do have rules, and we're not loosey-goosey. We, we, I mean, somebody, you know, some people call us, you know, we're a little bit, we're the frozen chosen because we're so narrow, but I think there's some, I think there's some good things in staying the path we're Christians. I, we, we don't, we, we need to be very careful on how we define our Christian walk and our Christian faith. So, so with that, we're going over a little bit. Let's go ahead and pray. And uh, I guess Stephen will pick up next week or Thad. Okay. All right. Let's pray. Dear Heavenly Father, just thank you for your word. Just thank you that you've given us our salvation through faith and faith alone. Give us wisdom as when we deal with our brothers and sisters and, and, and help us to love our brothers and sisters, with the love that only you can give us, only you can provide. Give us the strength and the wisdom to be that. Guide us with the Holy Spirit this week. In Christ's name, amen.